Hi guys and welcome to uh, the lab, the lab of uh, the ratio of E over M for physics 4B. We are in the Tuesday, Thursday session. So today is actually May 6th. So uh, let me uh, get into the lab because there are some issues that you guys really need to have a handle over to understand. And uh, so that we have that out of the way. Okay, so where is the share button? There. So again, these are the instructions that you guys find on the lab, basically uh, instruction, uh, the lab link on the Canvas. And uh, again, the typical stuff for the name and the forms and all of these things. So here is the deal. What we want from this lab basically to find the ratio of the electronic charge E which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative uh, 19 coulombs, divided by the mass of the electron, which is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 uh, kilogram. Okay. So that is basically the purpose of this one. Combine this experiment or this kind of experiments with the Millikan experiment where we were able to, uh, where he was able to find the charge of the electron. Then from here, you can find the mass of the electron. So this, determination does not rely on the value of E or M. Basically, you will see that all you need is a voltage. You need uh, somehow to find an estimate for the uh, magnetic field, and you need the width of the beam, the, uh, the, the, uh, the electronic beam that forms. So basically what you do, you have, you have, you have a, a, a filament that you put it under a voltage, so because of the heating, because of the joule heating, uh, the, the, there is a lot of heat and the electron they have a potential if the heat is high enough to basically escape the metal. So once they escape the metal, they're sitting in front of the metal, so you accelerate them. Now once accelerated, you put them inside the magnetic field. While inside the magnetic field, the fine number of them starts to spread and go around. So in this case, what you do, you, you measure that and you measure the magnetic field and you measure the voltage that accelerated them. Based on that, you're going to find an expression for E of M over M in that case. So this is basically the lab in a nutshell. Okay, so uh, you guys remember, okay, there was a mistake in here in the original lab. So this is corrected value for each bar. Each bar is Planck's constant divided by two pi and Planck's constant is 6.626. 10 to the negative 34. When you divide that by 2 pi, the answer is not 1.54. So please fix that in your lab also. It should be 1.054. So the zero was missing in there. So that's why I corrected it in here. So that was a typo. Again, uh, uh, Lorentz force in here is uh, the forces on any given charge is basically the sum of the the effect of the electric field, which is in this case Q times E, plus the effects of the magnetic field, which is Q times V cross B, and this is equal to MA, where A is the acceleration. This is in general when you have an electric field and magnetic field. That's what the behavior of it. So this is Lorentz force that we've been dealing with. Now we know that the ratio of E over ME is 1.6 basically times 10 to the power 11 coulombs per kilogram. Why is that? Because now we know the charge of the electron 1.60210 to the negative 19. And we know also the mass of the electron is 9.11010 to the negative 31. If you do the on a calculator, this is a number. But that's not the purpose in here. This will be a given value. We want to compare our lab results based on this value. We want to compare them based on what this known value is. So this is a known value now because the charge of the electron, the mass of the electron, you can take them for granted as known now. But in the past, before this experiment, of course, they were something that you needed to determine first. So leave the objective as typical toward the end. This is how the apparatus would look like if we're doing it. As I mentioned before, there are actually two controllers. One of them is you raise the current high enough so that you can have enough electrons to emerge from the wire. And then the other thing also, you'd want to accelerate the car, the charges after they emerge and they go inside a region of space where there is actually a, 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 a magnetic field. The magnetic field, you would want it actually, there is a two, two coils. This is how the apparatus look like. They're called Helmholtz coils. Each one of them has a certain number of turns. 
there is an N turn on one side and there's an N turn on the other side, and each one of them creates its own magnetic field. But you don't want the electrons to go inside in here or this side in here, you want them to be between them. So you would want the magnetic field between the two coils to be as constant as possible. Otherwise, if it's variable, then it doesn't become reliable. So you'd want to change the parameters. You want to push the two coils further away so that, or closer by, so that they maintain a magnetic field that is more or less constant in between them. That is actually the ideal situation because you know what the strength of the magnetic field and then you can go about doing your business, trying to find reading how widely separated the two uh, the electronic beam is. Based on that, you're going to determine basically the ratio of E over M. So let's get to the theory a little bit. In the absence of a magnetic field, we have basically the charge of the electron. Each electron will be subject to V cross B times its charge is equal to MA. Because V in this case is perpendicular to A, why? Because this is a cross product. The cross product is always perpendicular to both V and B, to both vectors. So from here, we can conclude easily that the acceleration and the velocity are perpendicular. All you have to do is just dot the product in here by V and dot the product by V, and this is gonna be zero, therefore A times V is zero, therefore it's, it's really perpendicular. So this is typical of a circular motion. This is from physics for A that you guys have seen where the velocity is tangential to the circular motion and it's going along the, 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 the tangent, whereas the acceleration is centripetal going pointing toward the center. Centripetal acceleration for example, from physics for A is mv squared over r. And this is, everything is perpendicular to everything. So it's just ev b naught, where b naught is the magnetic field that we're talking about. Here. Cancel v from both sides and bring b naught to the other side and divide by E, divide by M, and I already have E over M from this equation. So from this equation, I have E over M, M being the mass of the electron, is equal to the velocity over R times B naught. So that is basically how we can arrive to this expression using F equals to MA. So again, I described the electronic gun. So what the electronic gun does in here, in this case, you have a filament that you would want to raise its uh, temperature through uh, the joule heating. Once it's hot enough, the electrons start to leave and then you accelerate them by making sure the positive is on this side. So you they go through this thin film in here that says opening. So the beam that comes out of it is really going to be a, uh, 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 it's going to be, uh, you know, it's velocity. How do I know it's velocity? Because, when it emerges, it has no velocity. And when it reaches this point, it has reached the one half of mb squared. That's its kinetic energy. It's accelerated because this is positive and that's negative. So the negative repels them and the positive is going to attract them. So they're going to be accelerated. So at this point, you know one half of mb squared is equal to the difference in potential. And the potential in this case for a charge is E times this, ele this electric potential. So from here, you can find also a relationship between e, uh, m and E because one half of mb squared minus zero is equal to E times delta V. So from here, we're gonna find another equation that involves the conservation of energy. And that too will give me an E over M or give me V actually. If I take V from this equation and plug it into this expression where I have V, then I'm in business. Then I have a solution for what E over M is. So here is the deal. If I solve for V, this is how it looks like. Square root of two times E times delta V. Now, all I have to do is take this number under the square root and plug it into this expression here, V. So what I will have, I will have E over M equals to one over RB naught times the square root of two E over M times delta V. I have this E over M under the square root and I have E over M by itself sitting in here. So if I square both sides, I will have an E over M squared on one side and I will have the square of the square root, which is just in E over M. Cancel one of the E over M with the E over M on the other side. And now all of a sudden I have everything. But before I do that, let me answer this question. They gave you delta V to be 100 volts. They give you the, uh, the speed. So the, the, you would want to find the speed. So we know what E over M for the electron is. It's this number.
It's this number, 1.6 times 10 to the power 11. So from here, we should be able to find the velocity, okay? For the electron. So calculate the speed of an electron. So all you have to do is just multiply two times 100, that's 100, times 1.6 times to the 10 to the power 11, take the square root and we will find the velocity. With the speed of a particle, that is both 10 times more massive and 10 times more of the charge changed? Absolutely not, because if E is multiplied by 10 and the mass should be multiplied by 10, 10 cancel 10 and you're good in good shape. So whatever the velocity in here, it doesn't matter. So it's gonna be the same thing. So that's the first question. Remember, every question is worth two points. When the speed of the electron becomes too fast, the above formula would be no longer valid and special relativity would be necessary. This happens around 10% the speed of light. What acceleration does this correspond to? So what you do for this question, you make V equals to 10% the speed of light. The speed of light is 300 million meters per second. And 10% of that is 30 million meters per second. So what you do in this case, you make this V to be 30 million per second. And you would want to solve for delta V. So basically delta V will be ME times the velocity squared divided by 2e. So in other words, it's going to be the velocity squared divided by this ratio. I remember the velocity is 30 million. So it's gonna be 30 million squared divided by two times 1.6 times 10 to the power 11. This number basically, or 1.5 something. 1.579 times 10 to the power 11. So that should give me an answer to this question. So this voltage cannot exceed that voltage. So when you are doing this experiment, you have to be very careful with it because if the voltage exceeds that voltage, that value, while you're accelerating it, the speed is too fast. Where this mechanics, where Newton's law does not work anymore. You need the relativity for that. You need physics 4D for that, okay? So, this analysis doesn't work. So when you're doing this experiment in the lab, you have to be careful with the, the voltage in here as you're accelerating this uh, these particles. They may reach the relativistic uh, velocities. The reason why this is may be a possibility because of the fact that the mass of the electron is tiny. The mass of the electron is tiny. So even with the smaller voltages, you could end up in disaster situation where the velocity would be too big. And in this case, you don't want that. So in other words, we want to find an upper limit for the voltage. We want to know if I'm trying to dial this voltage, how much voltage I really can do without having to break my physics so that this physics still holds. Does this make sense to you guys? Yeah, it does. Okay. So basically the point in here for question two is equate V to 10% the speed of light, which is 30,000 kilometers per hour second. If you need it in meters per second though, it's gonna be 30 millions per second and solve for delta V. You have E, you have M, or you have the ratio of E over M altogether. And now find delta V, okay? So that would be the maximum voltage if you're doing the lab, if we're actually in the lab room right now, this you have to be careful with it. Otherwise the voltage will be too high. I don't know if it's gonna be supported or not, but you have to be careful with it, okay? So we have E over M. If we solve equation one and two, basically, like I said before, if you square this, uh, not square, I mean, leave it as is, because from equation one, you need V. You need V in here. And you just found V to be the square root of two E over M times V, I mean, times uh, delta V. So uh, this value, then you have E over M on one side under square root, and you have E over M by, by itself on the other, square both sides. You end up with an expression for E over M that is equal to this number value, okay? So this is the whole lab now, basically. Equation three is the lab. So what you're doing in the lab, you're changing delta V, you're accelerating the, uh, the particles. And actually in the lab, we're going to run voltages from 125 to 200 volts starting uh, in, cre in increments of 25 volts each. So 125, 150, 175, and then at the end, we're gonna reach 200 volts, okay? Make sure that the 200 volts does not break, but of course we need B naught for that purpose, okay? Anyway, 
So we need to find the magnetic field too. And we need to find the radius R with which this beam is basically bent, okay? So that is the whole, uh, the whole, the whole thing. So if we do that, multiply by two and we found the ratio of E over F. So again, here is the whole Holmholtz basically uh, coils. There are N of them on one side and there are N of them on the other side. If you guys remember from our, let me share with you a screen of what we did in lecture. Stop sharing the PDF file and share the OneNote. And this is Tuesday, Thursday, and was it? No, it was here, yes. So basically when we did chapter 27, we looked at the, uh, was it chapter 27 or was it 28? No, 28. When we did chapter 28, I don't recall that. Not in 28, according to this one in here. So let me see. When did we do that? Looks like this is the calculation. Here is the calculation, okay? This is one ring from chapter 28. When you have one ring and we calculated the magnetic field, the left and right and everything else, we found it to be, so we call this one the X axis, if you guys remember, and the radius, we called it R. The textbook called it A, okay? So it's fine, we call it R or A, that's the radius of the ring. So when we went through the integration and we summed and everything else, and the magnetic field turned out to be mu naught I times R squared divided by two times R squared plus X squared divided by three halves of an R, three halves basically, to the power three halves, I'm sorry. This is for one loop, for one ring. But if I have N of them, of course, each and every one of them will create a magnetic field in that point. So all I have to do is multiply by N, that's all. So this is the expression that we have in here. X is from the center of the coil, from the center of the ring to the point where we want to find the magnetic field. That's it, okay? We want the beam to be passing through the point X. So we want to find the magnetic field in that point X, that's it. So let's be stop sharing and go back into the setup of the lab. Share the PDF file. So this is basically identical to that setup that I showed in the lecture, except I have N of them on this side. And I have two of this, not just one. I have N in here too. Except the origin of the axis is not in the center of this one, and it's not in the center of them. this one, it's in the center of the symmetry. So this is where the origin is. So I'm gonna use that formula that we will find in lecture, except modified somewhat. Let me tell you how you modify it. For a single coil, from the center, this is if we measure the distance, so we call it the z-axis first of all, we call it the x-axis in here. So it's gonna be an x squared plus the radius squared, and you have mu naught times the i, which is the current times the radius squared divided by two, and this is to the power three halves, but you have n of them, n coils. This apparatus comes together. It comes with n coils already pre-wrapped for you. You want this mini to have a stronger magnetic field. Think of it this way. You don't have just one ring, you have a bunch of them, where N is just whoever, but this one tell you how many uh, of them are in there, okay? You want to have a strong field. However, the origin is not, like I said, in the center of the ring. It's shifted by a value because the distance between the two coils is 2D, is shifted by D. So this is the origin. So if I want to find the magnetic field in this point in here, this point specifically. So what I'm going to do is, on one side, it's D plus Z where Z is starting from zero to this point. So D plus Z, and on the other one, it's actually the whole D minus Z, so that's this distance, because Z is this measurement. So let me, let me stop sharing so that you understand the physics, I mean, the setup, and share with you again the, uh, this thing in here from chapter 28. Oh man, chapter 28 again was not moving, that's why I had to move in and out of it. So let me explain the formula and how we're, we're applying so that it's not. So what I have in here, I have N of them in here, and I have N of them in here, oops. I have N of them in here too. They're supposed to be more or less the same. And uh, 
So this is the axis Z with which they are passing. And this is the origin of the axis. Well, let me get up the pan now. Here is the pan. So here is the origin of the axis. So this is the origin. This is the point I want to find. This is the Z axis, by the way. By the way. And uh, this whole distance is 2D. This distance from here to here, it's actually a D. And from here to here, it's another D. Okay. So the measurement from this distance to here, obviously it's D plus Z. This distance is D plus Z. And this distance from here to here, it's this whole D minus this distance, which is Z. So it's D minus Z. And the formula is the same. I have N in here times mu naught, of course, times I times the radius and in here it's called a squared, not uh, radius is a, so it's a squared over two times the distance in here from the center to the point where I want to find the magnetic field is actually z plus a squared plus z plus d, I'm sorry, this distance is d, plus a squared, the whole thing to the power three halves, plus the same numbers now, and mu naught i, because it's the same current running through both of them, divided by two times. Now the distance from this one to here is gonna be Z minus A squared, Z minus A, Z minus D again squared, plus A squared, the whole thing is to the power three halves. So this is the magnetic field due to both coils now in any point somewhere of coordinate Z, Z being positive or negative, that is the separation between them. So that is the formula that I have in there. It's not something that, that is completely foreign to what we did in lecture. It is, as a matter of fact, the thing that we did in lecture, except with this configuration in here, okay? So this is the magnetic field that we have in here. Let me make some changes on this function in here so that you guys see exactly how I'm going to plot it so that we are on the same page. Okay, from the denominator, let me rewrite it cleanly, okay? So I'm gonna call n mu naught i a squared divided by two. All of that, I'm going to take it as a common factor. So it's multiplying by. I will have one in the numerator divided by. Are you may sharing my screen or not? I'm not sharing my screen, uh, sorry. No. Okay. So let me, let me, let me uh, rewrite this so that everybody is with me. Okay, so let me write B, uh, the magnetic field now. So B, which is a function of how far we are from each coil, from the center of the coils, is going to be n times mu naught times the current times a squared divided by two, open parentheses. This is the numerator and part of the denominator from this term, and it's identical with the other one. So what is just different is just the denominator, which has one over one, I'm sorry, no one in here. Open parentheses, I have z minus d squared plus a squared to the power three halves plus one over uh, z plus d squared plus a squared, the whole thing to the power three halves. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a squared as a common, a common factor in here. So what I have in here, in other words, I'm going to uh, pull in here a squared over a squared. So I have an a squared over a squared and an a squared over a squared. This a squared will go in. So I will have at the end of the day, z, but a squared when it goes in, oh, I'm sorry, cubed, cubed, not squared. If I do a squared, it's not gonna work. So basically the way I'm going to write a cubed, this a cubed, not this one. This one is gonna cancel just this number and I will be left with an a in the denominator. So this one in the denominator is so one over a cubed. I can write it as one over a squared to the power three halves. It's the same thing, okay? Because I have three half in here and I have three half in here and I need to bring it in. So when I bring it in, it's gonna be a, a squared. So I'm gonna have in here divided by a squared and divided by a squared and in here divided by a squared and in here divided by a squared. A squared over a squared and a squared over a squared is just one. And it will have a z over a squared. So when I bring it in, it's gonna be just z over a because this thing squared and this is squared. So this is how it looks like. So this is gone now because I included it inside. 
So this is how the expression at the end of the day. By the way, this is a typical behavior when you're doing when you typical typical uh, actions that you do. No, not multiply by a because I divided by two a because there was an a squared, then I took an a cubed. Now, this is what you do normally to make to work with your uh, with your uh, your equations. So I'm going to call z over a. I'm going to call it x, and I'm going to call uh, uh, d over a. I'm going to call it c. That's all. So I'll have a z over a in here which is x minus c squared plus one, the whole thing to the power three halves, plus one over, again, x minus, or plus c in this case, because there is a plus sign in here, squared plus one, the whole thing to the power three halves. So this is the function I'm looking at. I took all the essential dependence in here and I placed it in here. So this is, this number has no dimensions because x, which is z over a, has no units. It's just one, because z is a distance and a is a distance, so this has no units. It's a dimensionless number. And this is also a dimensionless number. So this, I rescaled my problem, in other words. So this is actually some value of b. This is a magnetic field, actually. It's always current times mu naught divided by distance. This is just a number. It's actually a magnetic field. It has the units of Tesla. So all my units are carried by this thing in here. So I can draw out this function, b sub z, divided by this number in here, which is n mu naught i, divided by 2a. This is actually a dimensionless function that I can plot it, which I'm going to call it f of x. I'm going to plot it on a calculator to see how it looks like. And it's very important that we do that. The reason why it is, is because I need to choose a region in space so that this magnetic field does not change very much plus c, I'm sorry, minus c, not minus one, x plus c. So it depends on that ratio of d over a, because that c is still, I couldn't get rid of it. I mean, when you do this, your hope is everything goes away and you will only be left with the significant uh, uh, important parameters. The important parameter in this problem is the ratio of the diameter of the rings, or ring, uh, the, 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 not the diameter, the radius of the rings, or the radius of the uh, turns or the radius of the coil and how far apart they are. D is how far apart they are. 2D is actually how far apart they are. And then A is actually the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ratio, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the radius. It depends just on that ratio of the two. So that is my controlling parameter in here. So I already did this function in here on the calculator. So let me stop sharing that screen and share with you that same function, which is just becomes y now as a function of everything. So here is this function, basically the one that I was talking about in here. One over x plus c squared plus one to the power three halves plus the other one, which is x minus c squared plus one to the power three halves. This is exactly the same function that we're talking about in here, where x now is that ratio of z over uh, uh, a. In other words, how far you are really with respect from the center of the, uh, the, the, between the two coils versus the ratio with respect to a. So just, just uh, uh, reflects the position. In other words, I rescaled the, uh, the z axis and the scaling factor is actually a. And the same thing in here, I scaled the separation between them and their scaling factor is actually a. Uh, so yeah, same thing, a. But then the ratio of b over that number, I called it just a function y. So again, if you're not too familiar with this application, this is how you enter the, uh, the function. And once you enter it, you tell it to graph it. And once you graph it, it's going to give you this graph in here. But then I need to change the plotting range a little bit in here. And I need to change the parameter. I don't want it to go all the way to 2, actually. Parameter c, that is. Change it. Why is this program not responding? Frozen. Okay, now it responds. Good. So we have a value in here. So, so this is how the function looks like. So if I have the z small, uh, basically the c practically zero, very small, meaning the c is d, meaning the two are on top of one another. Then of course, or very close from one another. Let's make it slightly bigger. So it's still peaked in here. And the magnetic field in that region depends 
on where we are. It changes with the position. So it's not constant. If you are at the center, it's this peaked. When you move away from the center one way or the other, it has this value that is decreasing with the, the center, with the far, how far you are from the center, okay? On either side of the, 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 the center. The center is the middle of the two coils. Now, if I increase this value all the way to, let's say, for example, one, so that means they are too far apart, then there are two humps in here, and there is a dip in here, and uh, the function in this case has this kind of weird behavior. And again, it's not constant. The main thing in here is as I move away, is the magnetic field starts to increase because I'm closer to one of the coils. And then it peaks at some value and then it starts to drop again, depending on how far I am from them, from uh, the coils. Because as I move away from them, I of course expect the magnetic field to be zero. I want a region in space and you can clearly see that we found it right somewhere in here where the magnetic field is basically constant, at least for a good portion of it. That is the hope. That is how we need to adjust our device. We need to adjust it so that we are in that zone, okay? So when we are doing this lab, we want the magnetic field not to change too much because we want to apply this formula. Let me stop sharing the screen and share with you the lab instructions. We want to uh, take the magnetic field that we get from here and use it here. So we want the magnetic field to be as constant as possible, not to change, okay? Because as this beam is moving one way or the other, we don't want it to experience different values of the magnetic field because then that will impact the error that we will have on E over M, okay? So now we have the expression for the magnetic field. We're gonna use a Taylor series. And if you guys remember from your calc class, the Taylor series is basically this one. So B sub Z as a function of Z, which is this one, okay? I want this function to have this Taylor expansion. So if I don't move too far from the center, I want to have a constant behavior, which is this one, actually, the one that I'm looking for. So Taylor series says B sub Z is equal to B sub naught of, uh, at uh, Z equal to zero, and then the derivative of B with respect to Z times z over one factorial plus basically z squared over two factorial and the second derivative evaluated at that point, which is z naught, z equal to zero, and then the third derivative and the fourth derivative. So in general, you have one over n factorial times the nth derivative of the function with respect to the variable evaluated at z equal to zero times z to the power n, plus more and more terms, okay? What you want to do is you want to really say, okay, I'm not gonna, to, I'm going to have a beam close by the z equal to zero so that they can only keep the leading terms in the Taylor series, that's all. Because this is an even function in z, if you change z, you change this from z to negative z, this will become minus z plus d squared and this becomes minus z minus d. When you square it, it's the same thing as z plus d squared. So it's the same like this term. But when you square minus z plus d, it's just the same thing like z minus d squared. So this is actually an even function and you saw it too in here. This is even on either side. So uh, it's uh, odd derivative should be zero actually. And as a matter of fact, the derivative in here B1 is zero because you can clearly see it's a peak in here or a peak in here or actually a minimum in here. So it's always the first derivative is zero, meaning that the function at that point is, uh, is, is an extremum, it can be a maximum or a minimum. So B1 should be zero and B2, is the derivative, the second derivative, which we should be able to find. B3 is going to be zero also because of the fact that this is an even function and its third derivative should be, I mean, uh, be zero in that point, not everywhere, of course, because that's the point of symmetry in here and z equal to zero. So if somehow I can cook B2 equal to zero, then B sub Z for all practical purposes is B naught, which I can calculate. This one is zero. This one is already cooked to be zero. This one is zero. So the, main, the next contribution is of the order Z to the power four. What I'm going to do to avoid that situation, I'm going to stay to make sure the beam stays near Z equal to zero. Because if Z is very small, Z to the power four will become even smaller. So it's gonna be neglected. 
Does everybody understand the rationale and thinking on how we're going to manipulate our lab so that B is going to be basically B naught? This is the principle. Because yes, B1 and B oh, very good. B1 and B3 are going to be zero on their own by symmetry. Okay, and we can we can show that. It is B2 that needs to be just right. Okay. So this is your task now. This is what you got to do. Take this function with respect to Z, okay? If you want to use the same technique that I showed you guys to make it easier in terms of derivations and find the derivative of that function with respect to uh, Z and put Z equal to zero. First of all, we need to find B naught. B naught is easy. Just put the Z equal to zero in this expression. If I put z equal to zero, I'll have d squared plus a squared to the power three halves. And I have also the same thing, d squared plus a squared to, to the power three halves. So I have one half of that and one half of that. So I just so I have one half plus one half, which is just one. So it's going to be mu naught ni squared ni a squared over d squared plus a squared to the power three halves. So this, you're supposed to show this one and it should be straightforward. It is this one that you're required to do the first derivative b1 equals to zero. So you take the, the derivative of this one respect to z, you take the derivative of this respect to z, and you put z equal to zero after you do the derivatives. And you should find it to be zero. Obviously, there is not enough space in here to answer this question. So there are two approaches. I'm going to show you one of them to do it. But in either case, you'll need to uh, something that apply for uh, based on that. So b1 should be zero. Now, b2 requires some work which is the derivative of the derivative. Once you find the derivative, you're going to take another derivative of, of that derivative. So it's going to be the second derivative. And that derivative you put in it, B, uh, you put z equal to zero. It turns out, according to this math, this is the number, okay? As I said before, if you guys struggle with something, and especially if it's an exam time, and you don't have, you run out of time, just assume that the answer is correct. And then uh, use it to your advantage then all the odd derivatives, as I mentioned, should be zero. Their derivatives should be zero in the points in there for z equal to zero, not everywhere, of course, okay? So b3 should be zero. So the next term actually that is not zero should be b4. And b4, we're going to ignore it because z is not going to venture too far from this thing. So if we do that, we're in business. Let me show you one way of finding the derivative. So I'm gonna stop sharing that screen. I'm gonna share with you the same calculator I've been doing in here. And let me go to the worksheet. So if you have access to this program, it's a, I think it's a very good program. If not, there are some online tools that you can use to take derivatives. And this would be probably useful for your calc class if you're having a lot of derivatives, even multivariable derivatives, okay? So what I'm going to do in here, I'm gonna take the derivative. And this program is called Deriv. And you have to pass in two arguments. The first one is the function f of x, and the second one is actually the variable. Let's test it. x squared, for example. I know the derivative of something said in here. Hopefully, uh, so the derivative of x squared with respect to x. So the second argument is the variable because you can do parametric uh, derivatives. For example, a x squared. So if I take this derivative with respect to uh, x, it should be two a x just to test it, okay? So the derivative, oh, did I take the whole thing to the square? I'm sorry. So let me uh, let me do it again because I didn't mean to do that. So derivative, derivative open parentheses of a times open parentheses x squared. That's the one that I want to have it squared. I squared everything. So if I do that with respect to x, It should be 2ax squared, 2ax, okay? Just to test it, okay? Because you would want to test your program to make sure. So let's take that derivative of that complicated function that we saw it, okay? This function. So, derivative, open parentheses of one over open parentheses and the first thing is open parentheses again, x minus c squared, or is it plus c? It doesn't matter. They're symmetrical anyway. So it's plus c actually. Let's be consistent. Plus c. The whole thing is squared 
plus uh, one, the whole thing to the power, open parenthesis, three halves. Plus one over, open parenthesis, open parenthesis, so it's x minus c now, squared, plus one, close parenthesis to the power, open parenthesis, three halves. Nice to have a calculator that does all of this thing. But before I do that, I need to pass in the variable with which I'm taking the, the derivation, which is the x variable. This is equivalent to writing d sub f of x, with d sub f, df over dx. So you need to explicitly tell it which variable you're taking the, the derivation with respect to. Obviously, this is a derivative. What happened if I put x equals to zero? If I put x to equal to zero, the denominator will be the same because I will have c squared plus one to the power five halves, and I have c squared plus one to the power five halves. So numerator, this will be three x minus zero, I mean three c minus zero, which is three c, and this will be minus zero plus three c. So we'll have a minus three c plus three c, and that is zero. The denominator is the same. So obviously, if I sub in the, the value of x equals to zero in this expression, I find b1 to be zero. And that is the, the first question. The second question is to find the second derivative and plug in x equals to zero also in it, okay? So what we do in this case is, again, we're not gonna write this whole expression. We're just gonna double click on it. So this is the function that we want to take the derivative. Oh man, I wrote it two times. Oh man. Let me delete everything in here. So this is a function, really. Everything else is the same. If you don't believe me, let's delete the whole thing and double click on it once. Okay, so that is a function and take the derivative of this function with respect to x. So this amounts to taking the derivative of the derivative, which is the second derivative, okay? So this is the second derivative for this, for this, this expression here. Now comes the substitution. If I put x equals to zero, and x equals to zero, the denominator in here will be c squared plus one to the power five halves. And in here, I will have c squared plus one to the power five halves. It's the same denominator. And in here, I have minus three, and in here, I have minus three. So it's gonna be minus six, basically, divided by c squared plus one to the power five halves. Here, I have zero, I have zero, so I have 15 c squared, I have zero and I have zero, so I have 15 C squared. So the numerator is the same too. It's 15 C squared. The denominator, X equals to zero. So they're gonna be C squared plus one to the power seven halves and C squared plus uh, one to the power seven halves. All I have to do is multiply this one by C squared plus one. That's all, that's it, to bring it to the same power. Multiply this one by that. And then find the common denominator. The common denominator is gonna be C squared plus one to the power seven halves. And in order to go from five halves to seven halves, all I have to do is just multiply by add one to it, basically, two over two. In this case, so it's just multiplying by c squared plus one. So in other words, you can just take this expression in here and just remove this one and tell it to evaluate. I don't know if it's gonna evaluate it or not, honestly. I didn't test this one. So if we have, uh, if you guys have access to a program called Mathematica, or one of these things that can do algebraic manipulations for you. Uh, this is basically, uh, I'm putting uh, x to be zero in here, that's all. Okay. So everywhere I see uh, x, I'm gonna sub it for its value, which is zero. So this is the answer, okay. 30 C squared, can we reduce this expression? Obviously, if I read this, uh, reduce this expression, I have to multiply this one by, so it's gonna be 30 C squared, minus six, which is, a, I'm looking just at the numerator, I'm not, I don't care about the denominator. I know the denominator will have a seven over two, just like the expression that you have in the lab instruction, there is a seven over two to the power in that uh, denominator. Six times, again, uh, c squared plus one. 
So the numerator is going to have this, this one in here, 24 C squared uh, minus C, minus six, okay? Take six as a common factor. So you'll be left 24 divided by six, that's four. So you're gonna be left with uh, four C squared minus one. And now if you restore all of your variables, everything will go, will, 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 will come back again, okay? So remember how I define C, remember how I define things. This is my approach to it because I'm lazy and I really don't want to do the derivations. If I do it, I'm gonna make mistakes. Again, you can do that. You can live with it. This is an online instruction. This tool as any other online tool that you can use is actually a great tool. This course is not about calculus and how to learn how to do derivatives. That is your calculus instruction is gonna assess you on that. This course is about understanding the physics of what you need to do it takes to get to the problem. And the problem in here, in this case, you want to have the function as least changing with the with position as possible so that the lab works. And this lab, actually, we have it in, on campus, okay? So this is an actual lab. This is what you would do to understand that B is not changing very much, okay? So let me share with you the instructions. So remember, are you looking at the PDF file or are you looking at the OneNote? Um, it's on the... PDF file. Yeah, the very one good. with the instructions, yeah. Okay, so very good. So B0, it's easy. B1 is zero. And they, we can do it with the, with the program that I showed you. B2 has that D squared plus A squared to the power seven halves. This is all the variables basically restored. Remember, C was my D over A. And uh, the function itself had this factor divided by it, so I need to restore it again. If I do that, there was actually 24 uh, C squared minus one. And minus six, I'm sorry. So the six comes out, it's gonna be four times C squared minus one and C is actually D over A. So you take everything. So this is the correct value and the correct answer in here, okay? Once you do that, you're requiring that B2 is equal to zero. Look, here is the deal. If D times two is less than A, in other words, for D squared minus A squared is, is less than, that means it's B2 is negative. And if B2 is negative, the function is concave. You saw it actually in the graph. When I did the animation, when I changed C, it becomes concave. If D for D squared minus A is positive, that means it's a convex. Simple as that, okay? That is basically what controls the situation. In other words, if the distance is small enough, you have that shape in there. If it's big enough, you have the other shape. If it is just what the doctor ordered, namely exactly, D is half of A over two, half of A, then this becomes zero, and that's exactly what you want. You would adjust the distance between the two coils, so that the distance, or it was twice the distance, this distance is exactly as the radius. In other words, 2D is exactly as A. If you do that, and this is a reasoning for it, this is how you do it. I hope you understand this step because it's actually very important when we do labs in general. And if you're gonna be an experimental physicist or an engineer or something like that, adjusting your, your the device, adjusting your, your measurement device is critical to a successful uh, uh, experiments. This is what scientists do. This is what engineers also will be doing too. This is a very powerful lab. Now, if we do that, now if D is equal to A over two, now we can sub back into this expression. Well, in this case, I have just A squared over four plus A squared, take the common denominator, which is gonna be five A squared over four, and then the whole thing to the power three halves, and that's gonna give you this expression. It does not depend on D anymore because D is A over two, okay? So this is B naught, obviously B1 is zero, B3 is zero, and B2, you cooked it yourself to be zero. You chose D to be exactly half of an A, so that B2 is zero. So the next main contribution is coming from B4, who cares? Don't go too far. Don't wander too far from, <laughs> from, the, uh, from the origin. At that point, you're in good shape. You don't worry about it, okay? So 
So at this point, we have some numbers in here to plug in. We have n is equal to 190, a is 14 centimeters, and we want the error in here. So we have n, the number of coils, that's actually uh, the, the manufacturer give you this one. You have the radius a, i you're changing it, and mu naught you're, you're, you have control of it. So you know how much b naught is going to be. So again, now the data collection. Let's go into the link in here. So I click the link, takes me to the link. Once I'm in the link, I'm going to stop this thing in here and share with you how. I mean, the data collection is not hard now, but we're doing this lab. It's really time consuming also in terms of the actual data that you do, because you have to do so many adjustments and make sure you keep track of everything in here. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So it says in the instructions, if you need it to do 125 volts, once you do 125 volts, you're supposed to collect the data. And once you collect the data, you have five currents, one amp, one and a quarter amp, one and a half amp, 1.5, 1.75 amp, and you have a two amp. You have the reading for the voltage each time. Okay. The voltmeter, the, 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 the actual device will give you a voltage reading, the accelerating voltage. And you will have how wide the two uh, the two sides of the beam is. Okay. You have an L1 and L2. And then you have all of these numbers in here for each one of this one. So you'll have a set of five data. You're supposed to turn it off, change the dial on the volume to 150 volts, and you collect the data again. Okay. That will be your data, similar to before. You have L1 and L2, and you have all of these numbers, which you're supposed to be putting on a table somewhere. Then you can turn it off again. And you're going to change the voltage to 175 volt. When you do put a voltage, hit enter, that's it. So now I have 100, 175 volt. Again, I'm going to collect the data, take all of my readings in here, and put them on the table. Okay. Turn it off one final time, change the voltage to 200 volts, collect the data. This is nice, actually, if we were in the lab, this is really, I have seen this lab extending very, very far, very long, okay? And the activity that we just did actually would be part of a pre-lab. You don't do it in the lab. You have to do it at home and bring it ready to go, okay, to show that you have done everything. So this, most of the time, you will be wasting it on these things. Not really wasting it. I mean, doing actually, earning your, 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 your. So now we have all of the data. We can stop sharing. And let me go with the, with the, for the lab instructions, okay? So this is the gun that we were talking about, the filament and the beam and all of these things and how you're going to need all of these things that I was talking about, I just did them, okay? So this is the table now. So these numbers, you don't have to worry about them. You must have collected already the voltages for each current in here. It should be around 125 volts. The L's in here in centimeters and the same thing in here for 150 volts. For 175 volts for 200 volts. Now take the data and put it in the Excel file. So let me sh stop sharing the file, the, this thing in here, and share with you the Excel file. So this is how the Excel file would look like. So we have 125 volts. We have the different voltages for it. We have L1 in centimeters. We have L2 in centimeters. Same thing for 100 volts, 150 volts, 175, 200, and so on and so forth. So we have all of the data that we need in here, OK? So we're putting it in there. So transfer your data to the Excel, to this table. Uh, You're going to, you see in the Excel file, there is, it says the box fixing in here. Is it north or south? Okay. So this is, leave it to north, okay? Don't, don't change it in here. Because if we were really in the lab, you have to really be careful in here. Are you facing the north pole or south pole? Because the reading would matter. Because you need the magnetic field of the lab. So assume that this is facing north. Okay, 
And then it's going to give you the other values, basically the sigma that you needed for the lab in here. It's going to give you also the ratio of E over M, which is really what you want to find in here. And uh, the actual E over M, this is the value that we saw in the error, okay? So in this case, with no adjustments, it, that means that B sub earth is gonna be zero. So put zero in here, okay? But then the next question, it tells you to go to Noah's website. So let me stop sharing the Excel file and share with you the instructions first. It tells you to go to Noah's website. So I'm gonna click on this link in here and I'm gonna allow it because it's asking me, do you really want to allow that? Yes, I want to. And let me stop sharing that PDF file and share with you the Noah's website. I want to find the location. I'm going to use the college. Make sure it's in the magnetic field. Okay, it might the, the, the default to some other value. So here is the address of the college. Okay. So I'm going to get the altitude and latitude for this location. And here they are. Make sure it's also in north. Make sure this one is in the west because we are in the west with respect to the longitude. And also we want the height. Make sure you change it to feet. And if you want to Google the location for... Uh, for uh, uh, Norco College with respect to, to, uh, to uh, how high it is with respect to the sea level, you'll find it's about 640 feet, okay? And when you hit enter, it's going to give you the readings in here in nano Teslas, okay? So it's gonna give you the reading in nano Teslas. This is the total field that you will need, 46,529. On uh, the date that we did this experiment, on the date that you did this experiment, okay? And you're gonna get probably some errors because of that, because in actual lab, you do the actual uh, Helmholtz uh, apparatus and it's going to take the actual magnetic field that is in the lab on that day, okay? What changes from day to day and time to time in the year. So uh, you will get probably errors for it because of that. But if we are in the lab, this error will be controlled this way. So again, this is how you do it. Then take this value, okay? Make sure you convert it to, to, to Gauss and you go back, stop sharing, and you go back, share the Excel file. And you place it in here in Gauss. There is a conversion. 100,000 nano Teslas is one Gauss. So you need to have this in Gauss. You put it in here. Then you do something and then you follow the instructions from the rest in here on how to find there is a solver. So in my case, the solver, I have to go to file and their options. And in their options, I'm going to go to add is. Are you guys looking at the Excel file or not? Yeah, it's the Excel file. On yes. Right now. So you, yes, the Excel yeah. file. Very good. So you go to the add is. When you click on the add is, it should give you a bunch of add ins in here. And I don't see the solver add-in. Here's the one that we want in here, okay? So we want to add it to this file. So I'm gonna click on it. You need that and say, okay. And now it should have been added. If I go to data, where is the, sol here is the solver, you see it? But I'm not, I don't have any data in here to solve for. So it's gonna ask me questions. What do you want me to solve? So let me stop sharing and share with you the PDF file. So I've done a lot of things in here that are in the instruction already. So including the browser and found the location and did the solver in here. So this is the, when it asks you to solve, you have to target K11, that's the set objective and set to min. And then you have to set the variable that you to change is K8. Make sure you have it in this format and leave this one unchecked. And the method of solving, you say it's a GRG nonlinear, okay? Once you do that, you're going to get new values now for the uh, E over M. Because now it basically takes into effect the fact that you're, you, you had been playing around with a current and a voltage but there was an influence from outside already on those moving uh, charges. 
okay, due to the magnetic field of the Earth in that location. Okay, so it's going to remove that and give you the proper reading for E over M. In other words, it's going to give you a better error in here. So if you go back into the tables, you should have a better E over M now under the solvers from question six and seven, and then the error should be less. Okay. No, that's the sigma. So this is the errors in here, and all of these values are coming from the uh, from the uh, from the Excel file. There are two errors from the Excel file: the sigma errors, and there is also the actual error error that you're going to report from the Excel file. Based on this, from question six and seven and this uh, solver, you should be getting a good value for E over M, and explain what you did in the lab and your errors. Does this sound like fun? Sounds like a really long one. <laughs> That's why I told you guys don't miss this thing, okay? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna have to start Actually, this. Actually, I'm weekend. glad. I'm I'm really glad I came. You're very good. Same. Listen, guys, I'm hoping this is. Uh, I know Gonzalo uh, late, so hopefully you can uh, go back to the five ten minutes that you missed, and everybody else who is not live also to go through these things because this is a powerful learning thing combine so many things that we learned in class and physics already, stuff that you guys learned from physics for A, name, F equals to MA and things like that, stuff you learned from calculus, now functions take derivatives and things like that, and hopefully some shortcuts on how to do your calculus stuff too. And uh, at the end, you will end up with a good ratio of the charge of the electron over the mass of the electron, which you can take with you anywhere and with confidence that you know how to do. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing the I'm gonna stop recording. I'm sorry. And then let me stop recording first.